Hungerford, typical small English country town. It rests beside the Kennet River and the Kennet and Avon Canal, where the downs and valleys of Berkshire gently merge with the plains of Wiltshire. A quiet town, proud of its heritage, pleased to boast that it keeps itself to itself, except that is, as springtime approaches, when something curious happens to Hungerford. For just like the legendary Brigadoon, just once a year, quiet little Hungerford comes alive. It all happens at Hocktide, but behind all that once a year jollity, there is an all year round following of traditions and duties that makes Hungerford unique in all England. This is a town that for more than five centuries has elected the officers of their Hocktide Court. The constable being the first citizen of Hungerford, the port reef, bailiff, water bailiffs, overseers of the common, keepers of the keys to the common coffer, ale tasters, tithing men, bellmen and blacksmith. Well, the constable is um, like a managing director really of a limited company, uh, working on a voluntary basis. Uh, for many years the workings of the town and manor were a mystery to me uh, and perhaps aren't very well known to many local people. The charity of the town and manor is administered by a body of ten trustees who are elected by the inhabitants of Hungerford. The charity is separate from the people of Hungerford who've got common rights uh, in that they are elected, although it's interlinked by the office of constable of the town and manor who must always be a commoner. Their customs honour the memory of their 14th century benefactor, John O'Gaunt. John O'Gaunt, fourth son of Edward III, according to Shakespeare, was the uncle of Richard II, who spoke the immortal words, this royal throne of kings, this sceptred isle, this earth of majesty, this seat of Mars, this other Eden, demi-paradise, this fortress built by nature for herself against infection and the hand of war. Well, be that as it may, the people of Hungford know only that John O'Gaunt was so fond of them, he left them a legacy of precious rights forevermore. Commoners of the town and manor of Hungerford own 99 of the old high street properties in the town. They still enjoy unique grazing, hunting and fishing rights, and those rights are still protected today by their constable, his elected officers and court, and that even includes the right to gather watercress from the marsh. Isn't it wonderful, gathering watercress on the marsh, the kind of thing that people go thousands of miles to fight and die for, this right to gather watercress, it's, it's wonderful. Well, until I moved here 18 months ago, I was the rector of Colkirk with Oxwick, Cumpattersley, Wissenset, Horningtoft and Brisley in the county of Norfolk and the Diocese of Norwich, which is a, a large area of northwest Norfolk. So moving from there, where I had spent 11 and a half years to come and live in a, a small town like Hungerford, was, well, it was a change. Although, in a way, the same sort of spirit that I noticed in my villages there is also present to a large extent here in Hungerford in that it is still at its heart a small community which is struggling with the reality of expansion and new building and extra good communications with the outside world. But it was, it was rather nice after I'd been here about a week, so I think to myself, yes, I know this, I, I know the feeling of a place like this because I have, I have worked here before. And wherever one goes, the priest are always dealing with the same thing, which is people. So it doesn't make much odds, really, where you go and live from that point of view. But it is very pleasant to come and live in a, a town like Hungerford, which does have a community spirit of, of some sort, still going for it, which has good schooling and all the other bits and pieces which one likes when you are bringing up a young family, to come and work as a priest. So if we can now 
the start with the uh, selection of the Hoptide jury. Um, we need about 24 people to turn up. So I would suggest if we draw about 30 names out of the hat to start with and see what we come up with. On the first Tuesday after Easter, there is the selection of the Hocktide jury, when commoners meet to draw names from the bellman's hat, who will constitute the Hocktide jury for the following year. Humphrey Dugdale Astley Hope. The John O'Gaunt Inn, where the year's customs really begin, with the little feast known as the macaroni supper. <laughs> macaroni supper is held on the Friday before Tutty Day. Traditionally, the constable invites office holders to attend the supper to discuss what is to happen on Tutty Day. Originally, it was the day on which the constable met with his portrief and together they audited the books and balanced the accounts for the previous year. But why macaroni, you might ask? Well, it is likely that the tradition arose when, after the constable and portrief had audited the books, they and the officers would stay in the pub drinking. Macaroni was ordered because it was cheap enough for the constable to buy everyone a meal. Today, the officers pay for a ticket to join the constable at the supper. Another tradition which is kept alive is the mixing of the hoptide punch, plantagenet punch they call it. It is important that it is to be of just the right quality and flavour. This ancient and secret recipe, or that's what we're told, is for the enjoyment of those who will attend the Hoptide lunch. Some traditions do adapt to the 20th century, however. And I think I'm the first, and I think I'm the only woman that's ever been to the macaroni supper, because traditionally all the offices in a town of Manor of Hungerford are held by men. I'm not quite sure why, but traditionally they've always been held by men. And therefore, the only office that was conceivably open to a woman was being steward of the Hot Tide Court, to which I was appointed some years ago. And I go to the macaroni supper when the office holders discuss who should be put forward for election to the various appointments at the Hot Tide Court the following week. And we eat macaroni, and we drink beer, and we eat watercress, and we drink port. And traditionally, clay pipes are smoked, although I must admit I haven't indulged in that. I understand that uh, if you are offered tobacco, then it's it's not polite to ram it in, as Mr. Wink would suggest. Uh, I did but the way to take the, to take the, to take the tobacco into the palm of the hand, put the pipe bowl on it, that, and just roll it in, and that should be sufficiently filled over the bowl. Of course, it's all very hard work. This tradition keeping. Even the non-smokers have a go at it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, praise attention for your constable, Mr. Dennis Cryer, who would like to say a few words. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming this evening. I'd like to thank the two ale tasters for putting on this wonderful tasting, testing, whatever. Um, I know they have had one or two problems during the last week or so. The odd license that uh, we'd forgotten. Of course, we've never had to have one before because it's always been across the road. Uh, slight technical hitches. A barrel in the middle of the high street this morning. Another technical hitch. But anyway, we're here and we're all tasting ale. Uh, and I'd now like to hand you over to the two ale tasters who will pronounce on the ale. Thank you. This is a very, very difficult task. A lifetime of experience has gone into it. Don't spoil it by whispering. I'm in search of the perfect pint. I fear I shall find it one day, and then I shall never be allowed to taste another glass. This is not perfect, but by God, it's good.
A goodly brew. <laughs> Rattles, best bits are? Constable, is a goodly brew. Gentlemen, you may drink now. To be an ale taster is a big responsibility. Or at least it was in the days when ale was the staple drink of the working people. And the town's officers had to ensure its high standards. These days, there's a little more fun to the job. And so Hocktide Day itself finally comes around. And to herald it, the distinctive notes of the horn blown by the bellman from the town hall. The badge of office of the constable has been a hunting horn at least since the first constable, John Tuckhill, in 1458. The original horn was reputed to have been given to the town way back in 1362 by John Gaunt. Early in the 17th century, the original horn had become so battered and unusable that the constable at the time, Jehoshaphat Lucas, had a new horn made so that the tradition could continue. It is the Lucas horn that is still in use today, bearing the inscription, John Gaunt did give and grant the royal fishing to Hungerford Town from Eldred Stub to Irish Hill, excepting some several mill ponds. Oh, yay! Oh, yay! Oh, yay! All ye commoners of the borough and manor of Hungerford are requested to attend your courthouse, the town hall, at nine o'clock this morning to answer to your name on pain of being fined. May God save the Queen, Duke of Lancaster. At nine o'clock, the tithing men assembled at the town hall, where the constable presents them the tutty poles, along with the blessing, with God's speed, do your duty well. And the day begins. The word tutty comes from the West Country word meaning nosegay, and the poles are bedecked with an array of spring flowers. The reason for this dates back to the days when the houses had no form of sanitation and little importance to personal hygiene by some folk. And as the tatty men had to visit every house, the flowers were used to provide a breath of fresh air in the somewhat um, smelly surroundings. And I remember myself being a tatty man in 1967 or 8. Of course, that um, to do one's duty, one was um, not only collecting the pennies, but of course you were kissing all the ladies as well. And uh, it was not just a, a question of uh, kissing the nicest and the youngest and all the rest of it, but it was the old ones and the young ones, the nice ones and the nasty ones, and the ones with teeth and the ones without. So there's no doubt about it that the tithing men of years gone by had a tougher time than we had now. But first, the serious business. Uh, I'll now ask the steward to uh, start with the proclamation. <clears throat> oh yay, oh yay, oh yay. All manner of persons that do owe suit and service to this customary court called Hopton Court, now to be holden in and for the borough and manor of Hungerford and the manor and liberty of Sand and Fee. Draw near and give your attendance an answer to your name. I'm a solicitor in the town, but with regard to the town and manor of Hungerford, I am clerk to the trustees of the town and manor of Hungerford and the manor and liberty of sand and fee, if you want the full title, which is rather a mouthful. And I'm steward of the hot tide court, which are two completely different roles, but in fact have always been fulfilled by the same person. During the year, my chief duty is being clerk to the trustees, which is 
perhaps a cross between being company secretary and managing director of a small company and the constable who's the chairman of the trustees his job is a cross between being chairman and managing director of a small company in as much as at the meetings if decisions are taken I implement quite a lot of them and it really is like running a small company because the trustees own the town hall and corn exchange the John Gaunt pub they own the waterkeeper's house, they own land and water in the town. So they're sizeable landowners and have all the problems that are allied to those sorts of responsibilities. If you're present in court, could you answer to your name? Caleb Conrad Mundy. Here, ma'am. At Michael the Hop Tide Court, the commoners present answer, yes, ma'am. Those not present, they are signified by the town crier, who bangs down on the table the fines he has collected from them. But it's not all routine. Well, the sort of problems we have is that we frequently have boundary problems. We frequently have problems with fishing and with water. We have phone calls that we've got poachers down on our water. We administer the grazing on the common, so we could get the problem we certainly had in 1978 when we had cows walking up the high street because there was no water to be had and they travelled over the fences and the first port of call for any complaint from the police or a member of the public seems to be in my office and it's usually at half past five on a Friday afternoon when I want to go home. But it's about this time that the real fun of Hoptide begins. A mixture of celebration, tradition, and good old-fashioned horseplay that does so much to help the old town retain its identity and sense of community. Each year, there are two tithing men appointed. Originally, they were there to maintain law and order long before the police force was formed. On Tutty Day, they're known as Tutty Men, and visit all the commoners to collect a head penny or tip for a job well done. As the man of the house was usually at the Hoctide Court, the tip was collected from the lady of the house, and for those who had no money, the tutty men would happily settle for a kiss in return, for which they were given an orange, the fruit of fertility, or was it to remind them of Hungerford's support of William III? Prince of Orange. And to get that kiss, they'll stop at nothing. Here we go. <laughs> kiss, this is great fun. Who else? Who hasn't had a kiss yet? Have you had an orange? Everybody had an orange. <laughs> initial thoughts were, were, were thinking to sort of the end of the year, which are the traditional Tutty Day festivities. Um, but those thoughts got unsettled some two to three weeks after being sworn in, because uh, the original duty of the Tutty Men is to escort armed vagrants from the parish. And some two to three weeks after being sworn in and being given by Trungeon as an offer, a badge of office, uh, we were invaded by three or four hundred hippies on the common. Uh, I must say it was my... Uh, my intention to use my trunnion and remove them physically. Uh, but the local constabulary had different views and I wasn't allowed to do that. Uh, but probably the, the highlight of the day for me was when we stopped at uh, a particular dentist's house in the town. And there was um, some sort of uh, uh, reputation for being surrounded by young ladies. And true to form, we had three very nice young ladies in his house at the time. One of whom I attempted to get very friendly with. Uh, and was succeeding quite well, until my other half arrived. And she leapt upon me, gave me one huge smackaroo, and then disappeared into the background. So I carried on with my conversation, offered the other young lady another orange and had another kiss there. Two minutes later, the exercise was repeated. Off my other half went again. Three minutes later, it was repeated again. And then she disappeared yet again. In this stage, the young girl that I'd been sort of actively pursuing for the last ten minutes gave me a wink and said, I, I think you're all right over there. 
ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I think you, everyone's got a copy of the accounts. If I can uh, briefly run through them, starting with the uh, page, which is a, a summary of the account, effectively our balance sheet for the year. Um, this is the first year for a couple of years that the accounts have not been materially affected by the town hall building repairs. And I'm pleased to say that the town's overall balances have risen by £16,978, leaving, leaving us with a cumulated income of £84,942.67. Now, with our town council, we have a town council in Hungerford, which uh, is the old parish council, and the other town council has a mayor. But we, as or the trustees with me as their clerk, are very different and it's difficult to explain exactly how they tie in with the town council but they are landowners, they're trustees and they don't have the powers of the town council but they have separate powers and separate responsibilities. They own the market rights, they own land, they have responsibilities to the town and responsibilities to the commoners. Whereas the parish council fulfills a different role. But in recent years, we have had one or two trustees who are also parish councillors, so both bodies can see each other's problems. Well, the trustees of the town and manor are basically appointed to administer the charity of the town and manor, look after the town hall building, the fishing and the commons. Um, the only trustee committee, formal committee, is the buildings committee, and this committee actually looks after the fabric of the town hall. In recent years, they have spent just over £600,000 in a complete refurbishment job on the town hall, and it's in the wonderful condition that you see it in today. And so to the Hocktide lunch, which is the only occasion during the year when the constable can invite honoured guests to enjoy a lunch of roast beef accompanied by locally grown watercress and jugs of ale followed by the traditional Hungerford toasts drunk with the infamous steaming hot plantagenet punch. their lunch, the tutty men are presented once more with their tutty poles and continue on their rounds. And if some people believe they have seen the last of the day's romps, they're in for quite a surprise yet. Obviously, I've been told something about it before I moved in here, although when I actually arrived, if you say the gory tales that went round what happened to people, particularly new vicars at Hocktide, um, rather made me wonder whether I'd accepted the right living or not. But actually, when it came down to it, it wasn't half as bad as it seemed to be. as this wonderful lunch, first of all, which, to which I was invited, fed well, made to drink an awful lot, and then comes the, the process of shodding, that all those who have not been shod before are known as colts, and the reason for this I actually don't know, are shod. At a certain stage of the lunch, when everyone has eaten well and finished what they're doing, the tables are cleared away, rather ominously, it seemed to me at the time, 
and then large people hurl themselves at you and you are carried struggling and kicking, screaming and biting to the blacksmith where you are laid upon your back with your leg between his and he proceeds to nail a horseshoe to your foot. Now the reason for doing this rather strange pastime I'm afraid escapes me but until you are prepared to shout punch the torture continues. And the reason for shouting punch is that when this wonderful tradition first began, there was a huge punch bowl. And those who were being shot were responsible for making sure that it was kept full. And by shouting the word punch, the torture ended in so far that you were then allowed to pay for the refilling of the punch bowl for the pleasure of those who were inflicting torture upon you. As blacksmith, um, it's my duty to shoe the colts at the hoptide dinner. And the colts are the newcomers to the dinner. And the process of shoeing the colts is first I have my helpers, uh, which we organise prior to the dinner. And we set the people up and they are caught, hopefully uh, willingly, but occasionally against their will. It's very light hearted, there's no bad. Uh, feelings and bad fights, not very often, and um, these are held down for me to shoe by means of uh, fitting a shoe uh, pledger, which is a, a lightweight horseshoe, and nailed to their foot. This is obviously done in uh, a very light way, rather than actually impaling their foot and drawing blood, we tend to just pick a, a hard heel or, or just hammer the foot to make it feel as though it's... Uh, being driven into the shoe. They are then uh, offered the opportunity of buying the shoe and the nail. In fact, the money goes towards the punch. Um, in fact, last year there was a lady that uh, wasn't aware of what was going on. Although she saw it happening, she didn't realize it was about to happen to her. And the helpers, the catchers, uh, got hold of her. And um, she struggled, but then a lot of them struggle because it's expected to struggle a little bit. And it's difficult to know who's struggling because they really are struggling, or who's struggling because they want to just play along a bit. And we assumed that she knew and that uh, she was just struggling to play along. And uh, I shooed her and when she actually stood up and the catches let go of her, she was livid and she struck me. She struck me on the side of the face and um, stormed off out of the room. And I didn't see her again until later on uh, that day. And she didn't speak to me. She was livid about it. I just trusted, I tried to apologize, but I just guessed that someone would have uh, put her in the picture. And in fact, she came back to me a month or so ago, so it was nearly uh, a good few months uh, past the uh, dinner, and she came in to apologise, to say that, um, you know, she didn't realise, but now she knows the story, it was all in good fun, and, and she just uh, wanted us to be friends. You know. <laughs> oh, right, forget that. I thought you had a dog. Ready, I thought as it was congested in the hallway. There we are, that's your orange. Thank you. And your second one. Thank you so much. Come and get the keys. Yeah, they, they ought to have orange juice or drop of scotch to, to liven them up, I think. <laughs> yeah. Light, but you want malt or scotch? No, not for malt. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> 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 but you had a the the top there. Hello, oh, my darling. <laughs> I haven't seen you for a long time. <laughs> right, so... Can I make a minute, Bob? Come on, you have to know. I'm next. <laughs> the Tutty men visit all the properties, both houses and businesses alike. It's usual that they, along with the orange man, are invited in for a drink or two. And how many drinks would a tatty man have? Between 70 and 80 drinks, I would have thought. Well, we're not much tea and coffee, man. No? Yeah. It's nearly all scotch or beer and sometimes some Christmas sherry was left over. Mm -hmm. I had one funny occasion was with uh, when Dick Wallace was tatty man. We'd been across the town all had our lunch and uh, Come across the banks. Of course, Dick had just got enough drink by then. He said, "Well, he said, tell him he had some more money." He said, "Got filled up with copper." So he fills his trousers up with copper. Bank manager locks the door to go out. Of course, his trousers fall to the ground. <laughs> He's loaded up with copper. <laughs> so we had to go and set up some bracers for poor old Dick. <laughs>
people who own common right properties will traditionally en entertain the tithing men. And certainly in this office, we always look forward to the tatty men coming. Um, and it's always open house here. But certainly not always everybody understands quite what's going on. And if we have clients in the office, they are slightly aghast at the tatty men rushing in and kissing all women. We tend not to accept appointments on hot tide day. Certainly, I remember one year when we had a, a phone call from London on a very difficult matter, and the man at the other end of the phone could hear screams of, don't let them in to kiss me, I don't want him to kiss me, I'm going to lock myself in the loo. And he didn't know what on earth was going on, and he said, what on earth's going on there? And somebody sounds as if they're being raped, and I said, no, but I haven't got time to explain to you because it's very complicated, and it's the tatty man, and it's hot tide day, and everything else. And so after a long, hard day's work, or so they tell me, the tatty men return to the three swans, a little wobbly on their feet, where they are thanked and dismissed by the constable. Mr. Assistant, orange man. Mr. Constable. How do you do? Welcome back, good gentlemen. Evening, good evening. Good evening. Have you enjoyed your day? Yes, we have indeed. Good evening, Mr. Constable. Right. Still standing? Yes. Good. Well, I think it's now, it is now nine o'clock, so I can dismiss you. Congratulations on doing your duty, and I trust you've had a very enjoyable day. We have indeed, Mr. Constable. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Would you like a kiss? Oh, so <laughs> Good day. We had an enjoyable day. We, we, we did what we were expected to do. Uh, neither of us wished to, to repeat the exercise within the next week anyway. Um, and both of us were the opinion that it was well worthwhile, even, even if only because it was the next step to being uh, ale tasters, which of course we are this year. In my first year, I think we took the totally man on the wheelbarrow. <laughs> <laughs> took him over the wheelbarrow and I went over and drank his last bottle of scotch he had. On the Friday after Tati Day, court leet meets, being summoned by the bailiff and reminded by ringing the town's bell at 11 o'clock to swear in the new officers. First, the new constable, followed by the officers. John Leonard Newton. Dennis William Cryer. Robert Walker James. Donald Macy. Man at the liberty of Stanton Sea. In the said office of constable, and so you shall be there on this charge according to due course of law. You shall use all due diligence in preserving the peace within the said borough and manor, and preserving all rights and privileges belonging thereto, according to the best of your knowledge and ability. So help you God. So help me God. In the office of Bellman and assistant bailiff, and the crier of the courts of the borough and manor, until you be thereof discharged according to due course of law. No, Teddy, they helped my life, didn't they, really? Mm. But um, to get involved was, uh, I suppose, scrambling for pennies, but to get involved really was when I was made, uh, appointed crier in 57, 1957. Mm. <coughs> so that's, we haven't missed much since, have we? No. You have helped mum with I used to help mum with the polls yeah. a little bit, not very much, because I never did it right. <laughs> There's always much work to be done, and if we can continue to in the year that lies ahead in the spirit of which uh, the, the previous constable has carried out his duties over the last two years, then I think we should be very satisfied and uh, I should be very rewarded. Since I was constable last time in 72, uh, things have changed and changed quite dramatically. The town has continued to grow probably faster than any time in its recent history with the closing of some of the major workplaces in the town, uh, the town has become more of a dormitory place for persons who seek their employment in other spheres outside its, its immediate environment. But nevertheless, uh, all those persons, I feel, benefit greatly from the, the existence of the town and manor of Hungerford. They all enjoy the lovely setting that the town has got with the open spaces of the common and the marsh. And I think they revel to a great degree in the hot tide ceremony that takes place every year. And the amount of work that's done to maintain the rights of the commoners throughout the year all adds to this wealth of history that we have and, and our heritage and our traditions that we strive so hard to hang on to. All manner of persons that have appeared this day have been 
this court may hence depart and keep their day and hour again upon a new summons. To own a large portion of land and pieces within the town and its ancient high street, the town hall and corn exchange uh, is, is a unique setup. But the objects of the charity remain the same. The objects are to maintain the fabric of the town hall and the other buildings, like the John Gork pub, that the trustees own on behalf of the official custodian of charities, to maintain all the assets of the town of Manor of Hungerford, the fishery, the common, the marsh. But then it's for the, any excess income is for the general benefit of the inhabitants of Hungerford, and certainly uh, over the years the trustees have made generous donations to lots of charities in the town and lots of good causes in the town, and certainly continue to support that. Um, they've also spent, in the last few years, a major sum of money on the refurbishment of the town hall and corn exchange which they were fortunately able to do because they sold some land for development and therefore had the funds available to them. Basically, my appointment is that of honorary fishing manager and secretary to the fishery. And it means uh, a lot of paperwork, inviting people to come and fish here, sending out their bills, ordering up the fish, and in conjunction with the keeper, distributing them among, around the river. But it's a, almost a PR job in some ways, keeping in touch with these people, because our rod fees now are approaching a thousand pounds, and in times of uh, hard times, shall we say, uh, there aren't so many people looking for fishing of this calibre. We have about four miles of river, that's the River Kennet and Dunn, and uh, we restock on a very generous scale, on top of which we buy in small rainbow trout and brown trout and bring them up to a catchable size. Today, unfortunately, the river must be at least a foot below normal. And the sad thing is we've had three dry years. And at this moment, the ground water levels are approaching their historic minimums. Uh, this is awful, and all we can do is pray to the Almighty to send us a lot of rain. And with a bit of luck and an extra donation on his plate, I'm sure he will do that. The overseers of the common are the people who look after the management and everyday happenings on, on the common, and that is looking after uh, the business of grazing, the business of cattle, the um, uh, looking after the fencing uh, and so on. The whole thing is managed by the overseers and the overseers are elected by the Hocktide jury at Hocktide and their job, <coughs> there's about ten of them, and their job is in fact to keep an eye on the common to see that everything runs smoothly. Of course, the grazing was extremely important to the commoners because they were able to run their cows on the common and they were able to, of course, milk the cows and the cows had calves, so there was a certain amount of beef for them. And, of course, it was free. Um, it doesn't happen the same today. Some commoners have cattle each year. But the majority of the cattle that we see here, in fact, are from local farmers who take the grazing and actually pay uh, money to the town of Manor for the use of the grass during the summer months. With the Hocktide celebrations almost over, there remains Constable Sunday. The new constable invites the organisations and commoners of the town to join him at the morning service in St Lawrence's Parish Church. Everyone is invited to parade outside the town hall and to march to the church led by the town band. And so after nearly a fortnight of eccentricity, the folk of Hungerford slip.
quietly back into the normal routine. It's been that way since the 14th century. Let's hope they keep it that way.